Welcome back to Locked In. Super, super, super exciting episode for you guys today. It's one you have been requesting week over week. But before we get into that, a couple quick announcements. As you guys can see, we got the fresh new Locked In with Ian Bick, Mike logo flag boxes. These things look awesome. So excited to start seeing these on our video version of the episode. If you guys are listening on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcast from, make sure you check out our YouTube video version of these podcast episodes so you can see these awesome new boxes. Additionally, really excited to announce I'm starting to take calls with some agents in the podcasting world, and we are working on producing live shows for this podcast. It's in the early stages of development, but pretty soon we'll be coming to a city near you where we can do our show live and really excited to be working that out, working out the details, getting to meet everyone, doing live Q&As. It's going to be super exciting. Anyways, guys, let's get into it. On today's episode, we have Bill Feezy. He is a prison YouTuber. If you guys haven't checked him out yet, make sure you check him out on YouTube, Bill Feezy. He has a wild story and he went to prison for nine years as a teenager. This episode, we're gonna dive into his early childhood, the robberies that landed him in prison, and then his prison time itself, and how he was able to turn it all around and become a young and budding entrepreneur. Thank you guys so much for the support. Thank you guys for tuning in. And please, if you could do us a favor, go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from, and leave us a review. It helps boost our show and get it out to more people. Sit back, relax, and enjoy my interview with Bill Feezy. Bill, you ready to rock and roll? Uh, yeah, most definitely. Let me block this girl. Real quick. Oh sh. All right, I'm ready. <laughs> Let's do it. Bill Feezy, man, welcome to the show, <laughs> dude. This is like months in the making. You hit me up on email, and then it got lost in the emails, and then um, you, st I stumbled across your YouTube and. We reconnected and we got you out here pretty quick. I just threw you through a crazy travel day. <laughs> you flew in this morning. You're flying out quick after this. We got your Uber on standby waiting <laughs> to get you back. Hopefully you don't miss the flight. Oh, okay. God. Um, yeah, it's like, dude, it sucks. It's like two hours um, travel from uh, LaGuardia out, out to our studio. We're in the, we're in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Um, but I'm glad you made it safe. A lot of your followers always comment your name you have a really loyal following on uh, youtube that they're like bill feezy bill feezy yeah. <laughs> which is cool to see um but bill feezy isn't your your real name no how do you get that name well my real name is chris so when i was younger i thought i wanted to be a rapper so i was trying to come up with a rap name so i was calling myself i always like money I used to sell my toys that my mama bought me. So I said, I'm gonna call myself Chris Money. And then my brothers was like, hell no. Nah. And then I was like, Chris Dollars. And they was like, no. So I took the Chris off and left the C. So then I was C Money, C Dollar Bill. And then I just took off the C completely. and was like, Bill. And then I always be saying, what the fees? Since I was a kid, so people just start saying, be a feasy. That's awesome, man. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love the name. It really goes. <laughs> I appreciate it. So where are you from? Where, where did you grow up? I'm from Detroit. Um, we came to Georgia when I was about 12, 13. And uh, I've been there ever since. And what, what childhood like? Are you guys grow up rich, poor, middle class? Man, it was ups and downs. It was just rocky, like one moment. We had it made, we had everything. Next moment, I'm stealing tissue from school because we ain't got nothing in the house, you know what I'm saying? So it was just ups and downs. My mom was uh, doing it all by herself, you know. We had a lot of different dads. It's eight of us. Well, it was it was eight of us. One of them died, so it's seven of us left. And, uh, I'm sorry to hear that, man. Yeah, that's all right. And, um, yeah, my mom, you know, wasn't none of our dads there, so it was just up and down. You had no father in the picture? Do you think that affected how you grew up and how you would ultimately land yourself in prison? Um, yeah, that's possible. Because my, 
like my dad's in my life now. And it's a big impact. Like we real cool now. But but I didn't even know him for like the first eleven years of my life. So, you know, the people that I was looking up to, they wasn't the best role models, you know what I'm saying? Who who were your role models at that time? Um did you have like aspirations? Like did you want to be a certain thing when you grew up at that age? When I was younger, I wanted to be a rapper, a actor, um and a chef. A chef. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a throw off right there. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to be a chef. Man, I used to cook a lot. That's funny now cuz I hate cooking now. I think I've been door dashing literally like the last 50 days that gets expect expensive <laughs> yeah it does. i'm about to stop but uh i used to love to cook but i used to look up to my big brothers though and um you know they was all involved in the gang life the street life that wasn't the best influence you know what i'm saying yeah and did your mom ever try to like steer you on track at all or was she just like letting you do your own thing because she's just trying to support the family, raise the kids? To be honest, man, she worked so much to the point it was easy to hide stuff. Like you can be a whole gangbanger when mama gone and when she get back, you might be looked at like a little good kid. She don't like she worked too much, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I uh, I was kind of slipping through the cracks a lot. Yeah. She, yeah. Yeah. Now, now, if we had like some of your close childhood friends here today and I asked them what they, how would they would describe you at that time? What do you think they would say? Um, They probably would say I was a hustle. A hustle. I'm telling you, like, I remember like being 10, 11 years old. And being outside with a bucket full of toys that my mama bought me over time. And I'm selling them. I just always wanted some money. Yeah. Always. I was the same way. Like hustle, lemonade stands, candy shops, whatever I could do. I was a hustler. I'd get dropped off at the CVS next to the middle school. My dad would give me 20 bucks. I'm buying all the gum, candy bars, energy drinks, and I'm selling it for double or triple. For real. Out of my backpack, yeah. <laughs> Dude, I, I respect that a lot, man. You got to have that. And I think that helps you now in your YouTube career. You, you got to be a you got to be hungry, man. You got to be hungry. You got to be a go-getter. That's how you, you, you got to be starving, you know? You got you to gotta want it. And I, you definitely see that with your content, which is cool. Yeah. So when you're growing up, do you go to college or you never make it to college? I did, but I didn't stay. Was I didn't that, even finish high school. That was because of the arrest? Or? No, that was because I was just in class one day. <laughs> and I, I was just sitting there one day, man. I was looking around, all the students, and I just was feeling like it wasn't for me, you know what I'm saying? But, see, the thing with me my whole life, I feel like it's been, when I say up and down, like, I would know better, like I, I was smart enough to know, don't just leave school and don't have no type of plan because it ain't gonna work. So when I was sitting there thinking that high school is not for me, I know that most jobs ask for a high school diploma or equivalent. So I just walked out to high school one day with a plan to go to Job Corps and get a GED. So that's what I did. I left out, I went and got my GED, um, I went to Brownswood Job Corps a couple hours away from where I live at. And uh, yeah, that's what I did. And I got my um, CNA license, Certified Nursing Assistant. And I got kicked out right after I got that. And I came home and went to a technical college for physical therapy. And then about a little bit in the first semester, that's when I got arrested. So you had a plan, like CNA, physical therapy. You were on track to do something with your life. Yeah. What happened? Like, how did you get arrested? What exactly went down that, like, threw your plans in motion? I, this is, like, so random, you know, because I've yeah. never met someone <laughs> that has, like, a solid plan like that growing up, you know, the way you grew up, and then you have a solid plan, and it, it gets derailed. So what happened? Well, 
So when I say it's been a lot of ups and downs, it's a lot of in between stuff that I didn't really go into, you know what I'm saying? So um, we came to Georgia around, like I said, I think I was 12, just turning 13. And that's when I got my first weapon. A weapon, like a gun. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. And my big brother, see, my big brother had got kidnapped. And the people who kidnapped him, they, they beat him real, real bad. So when he healed up, he gave it to me. And he was just letting me know, like, bro, it's real out here. You know what I'm saying? We was living in a terrible area. So I used to see my brothers, people at school, they used to rob people. And I started seeing the power. That ain't funny, but. I started seeing the power that you have when you pull out a weapon on somebody. Like they would do anything, give you anything. So I tried it one day on somebody. I think I took a dude book bag. Just casually? Just casually walked up on him, pulled out a gun, 13 years old, took somebody book bag. And after doing that a couple of times, I went to thinking like, no, bro, you're going to go to jail. Don't do that. And then I just stopped for like five, six months. And then I just started back doing it. So it was like with the Job Corp stuff, the whole time I was in Job Corps, I wasn't doing that, but I was like selling drugs and stuff the whole time. And then I got kicked out for fighting somebody and I got caught with my brass knuckles. <laughs> Do you, do you hear how this sounds right now? It was too big. Yeah, I know. When it you was, put it on, you got brass knuckles, you got the gun. How how old were you at this time? He was too big. You had to have brass knuckles. <laughs> I was 17 in job corps. Wow. So do you think if you never got kicked out of there, you never would have went to prison? No, I probably would have still went because I would have still, uh, that wasn't going to change nothing. Then when I, when I left job corps and came home, um, I got a job at a nursing home, taking care of old. And this was so crazy about it. I would literally go to work on my good weeks, get a nice paycheck. I'd be straight. On them weeks where the money was low, I'm gonna go rob somebody right after work. And what what kind of money are you making from a robbery? <clears throat> so they had <laughs> they had me and a friend of mine on the news as the Craigslist bandit. The what? What did they call you? The Craigslist Bandit. You were called the Craigslist Bandit. Yeah. So, and you're kidding me. What? <laughs> no, I'm serious. So what we would do is we would set up ads on Craigslist. I think the last one that I remember vividly, uh, it was like six 72-inch flat screen TVs and a um, some type of dirt bike. You know what I'm saying? And the value of all this, let's just say it comes up to 12 grand. I'll post on the ad, I want seven grand. So you would call me and be like, why you want only seven for this? And then I'm gonna just say, I'm in the military and I'm getting ready to leave and I need something for it. So then they gonna be like, well, I can't give you seven, I give you four. And I'll be like, all right, come on. And then when you come to wherever I send you with $4,000, that's when I'm gonna pull it out and take it. You ain't never, I ain't never had no TVs or no dirt bikes or none of that. And we did that so much, man. We did it to the point where it was like a sickness. It was to the point where I felt like I didn't even have to pay for nothing. Like I, it literally got to the point when I ordered Chinese food or when I ordered pizza, I just robbed them. For the food, I might have a pocket full of money. I would rob the Chinese food, man. Just, just when it gets delivered, you're just pulling a gun. Yeah. That's mine. That and that, that's why I said it was like a sickness because it was just for no reason. Like you know, what I'm saying I can really pay for this right now, and I wouldn't just because I I just I started doing it so much, and um, <laughs> yeah. So what's the robbery that actually gets you arrested? that gets you the long prison sentence? How do you finally get caught? Um, it was multi, It was actually six, right? <clears throat> How do I know I go to my apartment one day? I think I was at my girl's house for like a whole weekend. 
I go to my apartment and they got like holes in the door. Like somebody been beating the door in and the lock is changed. So I go to my neighbor house, this girl I know, and when she seen me, she was like spooked. She was like, oh, you better get away from here. I'm like, what the hell happened to my door? She was like, the SWAT team. I was like, the SWAT? I got so scared. I took off running through the woods. I ain't even get back in my car. I was terrified. I'm like, the SWAT team? So I went on the run for a while because I didn't know what they was looking for me for. I had did so much stuff, you know what I'm saying? Somehow the detective ended up getting my phone number. He called me, was telling me he just needed to talk to me about something. So we going through this for about a good week on the phone. <clears throat> Once I changed my number for like the third time and he called me again on that number, I knew for a fact this house I was at high now, it was somebody in this house. Cause how would you know that? That you have a different number, yeah. And this, I'm not even changing it on the phone. I'm actually sending one of my people to the store, go buy me a track phone from Walmart in a, in a car. I'm about to activate this brand new. Mm -hmm. Never putting my name on it. So how are you finding out that this is the number? So I'm like, either you turn yourself in or sooner or later they gonna do it. Cause somebody talking to them clearly, you know what I'm saying? So I was just trying to drag it off a little bit more. And uh, he called me back and was like, hey, we had, a, we had a total misunderstanding. You was the wrong person. I was like, for real? I was so dumb. He said, man, we had the wrong person. He said, but you do got to sign this waiver because your name was on the indictment or something like that. He said, you do got to meet me somewhere so you can sign it. He said, and I could drop all charges against you. Man. Nah. <laughs> So you go and show up there. But I kind of felt something, but I was like, nah, they can't play like that. The police can't play like that. And I go, and I should have known it was funny because he going out of all places to meet him. He told me, meet me at the Dairy Queen down the street from your house. Dairy Queen, you know what I'm saying? I should have been thinking like, hell no, you ain't say no office or nothing. I went to the Dairy Queen and it was him and some lady and they arrested me. Just those two? There wasn't like a full armed SWAT team or anything? Well, nah, when I went in there, see when I went, it wasn't nobody there. Mm -hmm. It was just like regular Dairy Queen. I went and ordered some food, sat down, and then they came in and arrested me. And then when I came out, it was probably about three or four other cars out there. Was that your last meal as a free man, Dairy Queen? Yeah, it was some chicken tenders. <laughs> <laughs> it was some type of ice cream or something. So when I get to the jail, the investigator is asking me about, um, the investigator is asking me about, he's bringing up names that I'm familiar with, you know what I'm saying? But I'm just like, man, I don't know nothing about none of that stuff. And this is when I got happy. The man said, so you never robbed a piece of man before? So I'm like, oh, out of all the crazy stuff I done did, this all y'all got on me? So I kind of felt good about it. And man, I sat in the county for like a few months and then a total different county came and they had five, um, five charges against me, all for Craigslist. And what were the charges that you were charged with? It was uh, each one came with armed robbery, Possession of a firearm during commission of a crime, hijacking, and aggravated assault. So I had all of that was one, and I had five of those. Plus, this county talking about I robbed a piece of man. So it was like six of them, but the piece of man minus the aggravated assault, but the same charges from this. So I had like over 30 charges, you know, all together, but the main felonies, it was six of the armed robberies. And um, I just kept fighting it. Like, I, they was offering me pleas. Like, the first plea deal they offered me was, like, 25 years for all of it. And I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. So after, after, like, 10 months of sitting in the county for the pizza thing, the first, the last thing they offered me was seven years. And it was like seven years or it's just trial. So, you know, I kept pushing it off. I'm like, we're gonna go to trial. Cause my family was supposed to give me a paid lawyer and we ain't never get it. 
And when it was time to make the decision, you know, everybody was mad at me, my mama, my brother, because they like, that's a stupid crime for you to take a charge like this for. But I was like, see, I'm watching other people get life for all kind of stuff, you know what I'm saying? So I'm not about to play them type of games with my life. And then five of the other charges, well, not, it was four of them other five got dismissed because somebody actually admitted to participating in them and they were like pointing at me saying, I'm the one that helped them. But when the victims was called, only they were identified and not me. And they just got caught up lying so much that they dropped them off of me. So it was only one other one I had to face about Craigslist. And uh, that was the same process. It was just a back and forth to court thing for a couple years. And I just played out. They was, uh, so I was gonna do four years for the first one. So they knocked off my parole date, so I can't parole no more. And I had to do nine straight for two arm robbery. Nine years. How old are you when you get sentenced to this? 19. 19 years old. What are you thinking? Like, wh how's your mentality? How's your mental health? Are you, like, depressed? Are, are you content with it? Is it a part of the game and it's just another day in the life? What are you thinking? Uh, to be honest, I thought I was dreaming of something. I, it didn't even feel real. And see, matter of fact, I was 19 when I got sentenced to seven years, but they kept telling me, you only gonna do four years. You only gonna do four years and you gonna be right back out. So even with them four years, you know, my girlfriend was pregnant. She was seven months pregnant with my son, my only child. You know what I'm saying? Um, wow, that was your first kid? Yeah. That's crazy. And that affects me to this day. That you weren't there for your kid? know that I still can't beat her. Like I'm going through courts, paying lawyers and stuff. Like she she felt like if you wanted to be a part of him, you shouldn't have never went to jail. So she's not giving you that opportunity to make no, it right? She's not. And that, wow, I, ca I can't imagine. Yeah, that's crazy. That's like a whole nother battle you have to deal with aside from everything else. Yeah, so 19, and this how dirty they play my parole date was <clears throat> September of 2017. They don't tell you the exact date, they just tell you the month and the year. So it was September 2017, and then July of 2017 is when they called me back to court. And they kept calling me back and forth like that whole month, giving me an option like, you either got to go to trial or you are gonna take this nine years and at first, they was trying to run it um, consecutive. So they saying, I do seven years first and then start nine years. But my lawyer was able to talk them into running it all together and give me nine years total. So I already was at four, so I have to do another five. So I was 21 at that time. With nine years in prison. Yeah. So when you get to the prison at that age, What's it like? Like, are you welcomed? Are they giving you a hard time? No, I was already in there. But you, they switched you, I'm assuming, to a different prison? No. When I, when I went back to court from the prison, I was, I was already at this prison for like a year and a half. Yeah. I went back to court. They sentenced me to five more years, and they just sent me back to the same prison I just came from. So what's your prison experience like? Like, what I know you change towards the end of your sentence, no. but in the beginning, are, are you running wild? Are you like one of those young, hot-headed guys? What are you doing? Well, my whole life, I've always been a thinker. I ain't never just been too wild because I always understood it's some people in here that's never going home and they don't care about taking my life. So I've always kind of, you know, tried to be the thinker, but at first, yeah, I was doing a lot of stupid stuff. What was the most violent like altercation you were with or involved with in, in prison? Um, and this wasn't even in the very beginning, but it was probably, it was a, a race thing happened with Mexicans and black people. And my uh, roommate was a Mexican. And he started swinging a lock at me. He had a lock, I had a knife. Your, your own cellmate, it's just swinging at you. Yeah. So what, what ends up happening? No, it's, it's crazy. He's 
he's talking to himself. And it's it's funny how they say whenever you're doing good in life, it's like BS come your way. Because I was in the bed reading my Bible, and I just heard this man down there talking to himself, saying all kind of crazy stuff. I'm like, man, you know, and I had the option to move out the room with him before we locked down because it was just something else with, like, Mexicans and blacks. But he was so cool. I'm like, me and him don't care about that type of stuff, you know what I'm saying? But clearly I'm the only one I felt that way. He was down there talking crazy. I think he was uh on meth, and he was just down there tripping. So I got off the bed, and I went to ask him. I'm like, bro, what is you talking about? You all right? And I tried to put him on the door, I mean, kick him out the room. And he was bucking, he ain't wanna go. And we got to fighting, and he pulled, he had a lock already, locked on the belt. So I'm like, damn, he been intending on hitting me with this or something, because it was already ready to go. And he just started swinging it at me, bust my head. He was hitting me with the lock. I grabbed the knife out of my locker box. I stabbed him, he hit me with the lock. I stabbed him, he hit me with the lock. We was both bleeding when we came out of there. You're describing the story so <laughs> casually. Like it was just like another, is that what like, was a prison violent? It, yeah, it, it was very violent. Especially, um, see they go in Georgia's minimum, medium, close. Close is what you would consider like your level five, your high security prison. It's just, they just call it a close. That's the name for it. And I was at, close like seven and a half of my nine years and those are the ones it's, it's considered lifers prison where the people that's never getting out this is where they go the murderers the rapists the all the crazy type people this is where they send them but depending on your behavior they send you there too you know what i'm saying so those places are extremely violent now you're a hustler you make money you're an entrepreneur you've always had that mindset I'm really curious about how you would make money in prison with that mindset. What were you doing? Okay. My first four years, I wasn't really doing much because I'm wanting to parole out. I don't want to do nothing to catch an extra nothing because I don't want the parole board to deny me. But once I go to court and they deny me and give me five extra years, my last five years of prison, I was living like... I was living like king whoever. So I came back and I started selling my store call every week because the value of it is different. So we was able to go to store for $60. But if you miss store day and you got a $25 cash app that you could get from your family, I give you $10 worth of this food right now. And you got something to eat now. You don't got to wait till another five, six days. I started selling all my food. Then I started buying cigarettes, buying weed, selling it, phones, and then uh, that's how you hustle in there. I had cigarettes, weed, meth, phones, food, and for my last five years of prison, I was I was very 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 well off. How much were you making, like a week, a month, um, in this prison? I don't know, but I know. I know once I sat, I sat down once upon a time, probably two years into my hustling, and was really just writing everything down and calculating everything. You were doing the bookkeeping yeah, for the I was doing bookkeeping <laughs> for myself. And uh, I know at one point I was at like 80 grand. You made 80 grand in prison. Yeah. That's wild, Bill. I was paying bills for people taking care of kids. Um, Christmas, birthdays, all uh, from a jail cell. Do you think that's why some guys would rather be in prison? Like you meet guys when you're in prison that are happy to be there because they're making money. I know a lot of like the Spanish Mexican guys that you meet in prison, they're like, I'd rather be in here than out on the streets because they're providing for their family. They're hustling. They're, they're doing what they got to do. Yeah, see, I don't know about that because you could do all that out here too. I, I maybe it's the ones that weren't legal in the states that oh, I would meet, like in the feds. Yeah. But they, these guys were making a lot of money selling hooch, um, the phones, whatever. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, that may be, but I don't know. I think um, I think sometimes people also they they like the lack of responsibility. Cause I mean, the only responsibility 
you got in the prison, what, keep your room clean? No. You know what I'm saying? So, because I actually had a friend of mine that asked me that when we were in there. He was like, do you think this would be a smart idea? I said, what? He said, when I get out, I'm going to get a whole bunch of weed and cigarettes and make them into small bombs. And then I'm going to go out and do something dumb on purpose so I can purposely come back to jail and have somebody bring me that so I could get rich over like the next year or two. And my thing was in Georgia, the rate of you losing your life is so high. What if you come in here and somebody kill you? Then what? And you were thinking about these things while you were there? I thought about it every day. So I you, never relaxed. Your mindset was very elevated. Like you had a, a very strong, you know, mindset mentality that got you through it. Were you like reading it all in there at all? I did a lot of reading and writing. What kind of books were you reading? Um, anything self-help, do it yourself. Uh, Jack Canfield got one that I loved called Damn, what was it called? The Success Principles by Jack Canfield. And it's just like, <clears throat> it kind of gave me, you know, I stress no excuses now on my channel. No excuses, no excuses. Make money, not excuses. And it kind of put me in that mindset. Like every page, he's just showing you like how it can be done. No matter what the odds is against you, you follow these and you could be successful. Anything like that, that's what I like. Interesting. And now you were mentioning uh, a little bit earlier about cell phones in prison. Yeah. Every person I talk to, there's always like a different method on how they'd get contraband cell phones into the prison. How are you getting them in? Most of the time, I would be dealing with somebody that got a way to get it in, but he don't necessarily got the funds to fund the whole process as far as Whoever's helping him, he got to pay somebody, some officer, whatever he got going on, he got to pay somebody. He might not got the money to do it. So it wasn't just consistent. I had more cigarettes and stuff than I did phones. But with the phones, he might come up to me and say, hey, I could get 20 phones and I need $10,000. When I get them, I'll give you half of them. And... I give it to him. You're quite the businessman. <laughs> and when you give me half of them, these are Androids from Walmart that costed you forty, fifty dollars max. Yeah, I'm selling every one of them for two thousand a piece. You know what I'm saying? No, I was reading somewhere or watching one of your videos. You mentioned like by the end of your prison sentence, your mentality changes completely. You're into straight like you don't want to be caught up with the bullshit, the gang life, anything in prison anymore. Why does that mentality change and what happens? Um, I think after spending so much time talking to somebody right now today and then two hours later, I see this person get killed and this person was young. This person didn't have much time left. It started, I think it started making me feel guilty for my role of any stupid stuff I participated in, you know what I'm saying? And it just had me thinking about life in general. Like, bro, life is way better than this bullshit. You can live way better. It's so many other thing, ways to do things. So all of the younger dudes that was in there, because, I mean, I was in there with guys who 17 years old, and they in here with grown, grown men, you know what I'm saying? I just kind of started talking to them. Then I started going viral on TikTok. And I'd be messaging people back, just telling them, man, this ain't it. Y'all don't want to do this. Y'all stay out of trouble. This ain't the life you want. And I just, you know, made a, a promise to myself to just stay on that. And uh, that's what I did. Do you think if you didn't come or reach that mentality, you would still be in jail now or dead? Absolutely. 100%. I think. That nine years was extremely necessary. I think I needed that because if I would have never went to prison, I think I would have either got a life sentence for killing somebody or somebody would have killed me. It would have just been one of them two. Now, us as former inmates, we realize that not everyone has that mentality. They come out and they go back to jail. Why, why do you think that is? Are they just not finding the right reasoning that you're that you just spoke about? 
or is it society failing them? Is it the system? What do you, what would you a- attribute that to? I think it has nothing to do with society. I think it's all uh, individual. I was just talking to a guy yesterday that just did a long, long time, and he told me, man, they ain't giving me no opportunity. I'm finna go pick up a pack. And I told him, well, if you do that, I'm about to block your number. Don't ever call me no more because people get so comfortable making excuses. You know what I'm saying? I think what it is, one of the things, people do stuff and then they go to jail and then you read in paperwork. I think at at every point, every person is deep into their paperwork in the very beginning because you're trying to see what the hell really happened. After so much time, I think people go to thinking they done got smarter at doing whatever they did to get in here. Oh, I see how they caught me, so now nah, I'm going to do it this way. They think they done figured it out, but what they don't realize is the time you gone, they coming up with new ideas and new technology every day. You know what I'm saying? So I think some people think they just figured out how to outsmart the system, and some people just don't want to work. Like, they don't want to do nothing legal where they got to wait for a check. Some people just want it fast. And, you know, people like that getting blocked out my phone. I, I mean, don't want no contact with you. Good. So you won't be blocking me then. We're good. <laughs> no, I mean, we, we all have so much opportunity. Like guys like us that are able to come out of a terrible situation and, and build platforms. That wasn't handed to us. That wasn't handed to you. No one came home and said, here's a YouTube channel with 75,000 subscribers. And, you know, it's just, it's it, it's crazy. But I think there's there's definitely a power in... in you know, harnessing your past shit and using it as a motivator. But everyone has like the same opportunity. Yes, people are born into like a rich family or whatever, and they're given that stuff, but you could build that on your own in a way, and you're building it now. Yeah, what I what I tell people, everybody, I always tell people, um, whatever it is that you're good at, whatever you super familiar with to the point you can walk me through it. You know it like the back of your hand. Man, figure out a way to monetize that. If it's you talking about it, if you trying to help somebody else with it, figure it out some type of way. Even if that's starting a YouTube channel and making video after video about it, you know what I'm saying? Because that's what I did. I was at a warehouse this job literally was paying me $325 a week. For 40 hours? Yes. That's terrible. I went and got a second job. Was breaking my back at the second job. Then quit the first job because the second job was paying more. Then went and got another job. Quit the first day. They called me back to work. I came back, worked the hour, quit again. And I quit. <laughs> I quit this one job about three times. And then I just quit the other job. I just I just had to figure something else out. And I was just praying and trying to figure out what it is that I need to do. And, I, and um, all my people from TikTok was telling me, go on YouTube and tell longer stories. Because I always tell like a minute on TikTok. You know what I'm saying? That's how I started with TikTok first. Yeah, I was telling like a minute story. And I went on there and told a long story. I mean, I think three days later, I got an email saying, like, congratulations about a partner program. I didn't know what the hell they was talking about. But I know when I got that first check, I quit both of the jobs. I never went back to work. And you do YouTube full time. I ain't been back to work in uh, probably about a year now. What do you attribute your success on YouTube to? All in all, I put the most high over everything. You know what I'm saying? I always think the most high. And that's another reason I said I feel like I had to go through that because there's so many people that send me messages day in and day out telling me, like, bro, I changed my life because you stress is not worth it. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's a little dude I just posted on my Instagram story. He like, I, I literally stopped selling drugs after watching all your stories. He like, I'm just doing the right thing now, you know what I'm saying? So people like that is the, you know, the one of the main reasons I'ma just keep going it and I mean keep going, you know what I'm saying? What do you think your message is? Because some 
individuals that watch the content, there's hate. You know, they'll say we're glorifying prison. Yeah. Do you think you're glorifying prison? And and if you don't think so, which I don't believe you are glorifying it, what's your message that you want people to take away from watching your content? Okay, number one, I know I'm not glorifying it because I got almost 300 videos and and now one of them have I ever been explaining about somebody got hurt with a smile on my face. Now one of them have I ever been excited like, yeah, he went in there, he just kept stabbing him. Never. Not one time. The message is the your freedom, there is nothing in the world worth your freedom. I don't care what it is. I don't care how mad you get. I don't care how broke you are and you feel like you need some money, you need to go do this or that. It is not worth your freedom. You know what I'm saying? Because, like I said earlier, you can, I can go rob him real quick just for a quick come up, and then they could sentence me to two years in prison. And then I can go in prison for two years, and on my 30th day, somebody could kill me with a knife because they trying to rob me for some food. They could stab me, hit hit the wrong artery, and I could die. So that's the overall message. It's not worth it. Just do the right thing. Just stay down, and just it's, nothing is worth your freedom. If you could go back to your teenage self, 17, 18 years old, maybe right at the point where, you know, you just lost your CNA gig and the schooling, what would you say to your teenage self? If you could sit in the room with that teenage self across from him, have a serious sit down conversation. I would probably, and I know what I know now, I would um, just explain the same thing that I explain to younger people now. I would just explain it thoroughly. It's not worth it. Just stay down. Whatever it is, stop doing all that. Anything illegal, get rid of it. Just stay down. But if I could um, reverse it to where I had never went to prison, but I don't gain the knowledge I got now, I wouldn't reverse it. I would still need to go through it to be the person I am today. That's great, man. Bill, this has been a you know a great conversation. I'm sorry we're limited on time because of the travel. Yeah. Uh, we had that error with your driver, uh, the driver I got for you, bringing you to the wrong address. <laughs> um, so just so like our listeners could hear right now, you know, I'd love to have like you know we'll definitely have you back for a part two yeah. with some some better time constraints, or I'll come out there, do your channel with you, um, do like that full you know like hour and a half, two hour interview. But I wanted to at least you know, kind of go over your story. The fans have been asking for your interview. And I, I think we covered some really important parts today to your story and got a good message out. Um, but to the people that are expecting something longer with you, I apologize <laughs> on those travel, but Hey, you know, that's part of the business. Yeah. Shit happens. Yeah, uh, yeah. He, the driver called me. He's like, yeah, you know, we brought you the wrong address, which is an hour away. Yeah. I asked him <laughs> after, after a little while, I went to scratch my head. I was like, Hey man, you know, you, you know where we at, right? And he was like, yeah, yeah. I'm all right. And then I waited a little longer. I was like, Hey man. I went to thank you. I said, man, what the hell they got going on? I'm paranoid, too. I said, man, y'all got me fucked up. And then he said, man, we at the wrong address. He's said, a funny man. dude, right? <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, he's a character. He's a good guy. But uh, I said to the right address. I was looking at it. But oh, well, man, shit happens. I'm glad we got to have this conversation. Uh, we got your Uber waiting for you. Um, and thank you again, man, bottom of my heart for coming on the show and, and looking forward to your continued success. You're right on the corner of that hundred thousand subscribers. I think hopefully this video helps get you to that point too. We have a pretty large following. Yeah. Um, where can people find you at? We're going to link it on the bio too. Uh, my Instagram. Well, first off, my YouTube is Bill Feasy, of course. Instagram, Bill, F-Z-Y-F-R. It's Bill Feasy for real. Facebook is the same. And I actually am a new author now. I got a book out. It's BillFeasy.org. B-I-L-F-Z-Y.org. Awesome, man. I'll definitely check out that book. It's called I Did It So You Don't Have To. And I'm telling the story and telling them, just use my story. Don't even go through it yourself. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. All right, Bill. Thanks for coming on and have a safe trip back. Most definitely, bro. I appreciate it.